Hello people of YouTube and welcome back to Bigger Feet. Today we are doing a 16 millimeter film emulation tutorial. We'll be starting with camera settings, then color grading and compositing in Adobe After Effects and end up with some audio tips and tricks to really complete the package. Now, I personally like a film vibe that goes a little above and beyond authentic emulation, but you can dial these tips and tricks in however you like. So if you want it more toned down and authentic, be my guest. But before we cross that bridge, let's get to the footage. So 16 millimeter is typically shot at 24 frames per second at a shutter angle of 180 degrees, or if you are a pleb like me, 1 48th of a second. Along the same vein, depending on how accurate you want your emulation to be, you should stop down your aperture quite far, I'd say to f4 or smaller. The reason for this is that 16 millimeter film is super tiny and the tinier your sensor or film format is, the harder it is to achieve shallow depth of field. So because 16 millimeter is so small, you naturally get very deep depth of field. So if you're working with a bigger sensor and you want it to be authentic, just stop down the aperture. That said, if you're shooting on something like a Fuji GFX 100S, the effects I'm about to talk about would still look absolutely sick and I highly encourage you to just go ahead with them. At this point, you're just not really emulating 16 millimeter, but doing a weird lo-fi IMAX type vibe, which I'm totally on board with. It's cool. It's just not 16 millimeter. Anyway, let's say we've got our footage shot and imported into After Effects. Let's make it look like 16 millimeter. Let's begin by prepping the composition we are going to edit in. Regular 16 millimeter is four by three, whereas Super 16 is about five by three. So if you are using 4K footage, I would make my sequence 2880 by 2160 for 16 millimeter or 3600 by 2160 for Super 16. I'm gonna go with the former. Now we're gonna lay out our sequence. There's no right or wrong here, just edit the way you like. For simplicity's sake, I'm gonna stick with these five shots. Little voiceover, a little music, but we get to the audio at the end. Then we're gonna go grade it all nice and film-like. And since we're working in Adobe After Effects, I'm using Lumetri for this. Now, film doesn't typically have very high dynamic range, but it does have a really nice fall off into the highlights and darks. So we raise the darks to give us some detail to roll into and then create a pretty strong S-curve that crushes the blacks and whites a little. It's also important that we give it a bit of tint some bluish purple in the darks, some warm yellow in the mids, and a tiny bit towards tealish blue in the highlights. And while we're grading in Lumetri, we can also add a bit of vignette at the end. Now for the fun stuff. You can just slap on some grain and call it a day, but we're gonna go a bit further and stack some effects. Now, here's a useful tip to remember when you're doing any type of emulated look, whether it's film or VHS, and that is follow the light, which is to say you stack your effects in the way that light would normally go from out there in the ether into the eye of your viewer. In this case, that means we're doing lens effects first, then film effects, and then projector effects. So let's start by right-clicking in the timeline and adding an adjustment layer for the lens effects. You can do it clip by clip for flexibility, but for simplicity's sake, I'm gonna span it over my entire timeline. A strong starting point is the VR chromatic aberrations effect. First invert the fall off so that the center stays clean, then dial up the fall off, but don't go so far that you see your edges go wonky. Set blue and red to zero, but dial up the green. Just a disclaimer, this isn't how chromatic aberration works naturally. Normally you'd see one color in the fringes in the foreground and another color in the fringes in the background, but that is very difficult to emulate so I like this as a low cost alternative. Then let's add some unsharpness in the corners. The way I found most controllable is by creating a shape that takes up the whole frame and filling it with a radial gradient from black on the inside to white on the outside. Then tweaking it so that there's a good portion of solid black on the inside before it starts falling off to white. You can now make the shape invisible. We don't need to see it. We're just gonna use its data as a depth map for the lens blur effect. Add that effect to your adjustment layer then select your shape layer as the blur map and dial in the strength and other settings to where you like them. There we go. The center stays nice and crisp while the corners naturally fall off. Then we're gonna add some light leaks. These are more of a personal style preference and you can do without them if you want. I have a bunch that I use regularly imported here, but I've had them for eight years and I cannot for the life of me remember where I got them. Just do a Google though and you'll find plenty of options. Make sure they match vaguely with the light direction and movement in your footage. Pick the right blend mode, in this case screen or light and tend to work really well, and adjust the opacity to your liking. 
I would overlay different leaks for every shot and omit them for some shots where they don't make sense with the lighting altogether. Now we move on to the next step, the film effect. You can technically just use the add grain effect straight on your footage, but the render times are truly a crime against humanity. So we don't. Instead, I'm keeping it simple by just adding a grain overlay. Just like the light leaks, you can find these online or you can make them yourself. If you want to make them yourself, just take a 50% gray solid and overlay the add grain effect. Export a few variations and use them as overlays when need be. This way you bypass the need to use the effect itself every time and that cuts down on your render times. Then pick a blend mode. I like soft light, but hard light and overlay work as well, depending on the look you want. And again, change the opacity to tone it down. And in exactly the same way, you can add some film damage overlays. Find them online, make them yourself, blend them as soft light or similar, and tweak the opacity. The cherry on top is a little bit of exposure variation. On a digital camera, like the one I'm talking to right now, every individual frame is exposed in the exact same way. It's very consistent. But on a film camera, no two frames are exactly the same. So we're gonna emulate that. Add a new adjustment layer to your whole timeline. Then add the exposure effects to that adjustment layer. Hold Alt or Option, depending on your operating system, and click on the stopwatch icon next to the exposure parameter. Here we're going to type the expression wiggle, open bracket, 24,0.15, closing bracket. This expression is going to randomly wiggle the exposure 24 times per second by a factor of 0.15. Practically speaking, that means that every single frame gets a slightly different brightness. 0.15 is still quite a strong fluctuation, so you can tone it down to your liking. Then the last step on the ladder, the projector effects. Particularly in digital recreations of film, you often see a lot of stray light. I don't know how authentic this really is, but we are gonna use a bit of it here. We've kind of already done this with the light leaks and the lens effects, but we're gonna add some strong glare on the sides as well. However, unlike the light leaks, we'll make them ourselves. So grab the shape tool and drag a rectangle off to the left side of the screen and another one on the right. Make sure they spill well out of the actual frame. Select the first shape inside and give it a color you like, as long as it is super light and very unsaturated. Then repeat for the second shape. I am going for a sort of eggshell on the left and a slightly more saturated version on the right. Then slap on some Gaussian blur at a setting of 120 or higher, and then change the blend mode to something like classic color dodge for that nice, crispy, burny feel. And of course, as always, tweak it to your liking. Now we're gonna bring this glare on the sides to life. Go back to your exposure flicker layer and copy the wiggle command. Then select your light leaks again and press T to open the opacity parameter. Hold Alt or Option and click on the stopwatch and paste the wiggle expression. Now a fluctuation of 0.15 isn't gonna do much here, so we're gonna change it to something more like 20. Now the projector's glare flickers independently of the film exposure flicker. Let's also give it some movement by using the wiggle effect on the layer's rotation. Hit R to quickly get there. We don't need it to be frantic, so let's set it to change every 0.5 seconds with a variation of five degrees thereabouts. Now for the final touches putting this in a simple film reel looking shape. First, I created this shape in Illustrator. It's just a black rectangle with three rounded holes in that four by three aspect ratio. Important to note is that you leave some gaps between the holes. You can of course just create this shape in After Effects itself, but I personally prefer Illustrator's controls for shape building, and it's honestly just nice to have a preset vector shape to work with. Back in After Effects, we now create a new composition in which we'll put everything together. Assuming you'll want to deliver the final thing in 16x9, this sequence is a regular 3840x2160. Now you drop your original composition into this new composition and scale it to about 85%. You can get to the scale parameter quickly by just pressing S. Then duplicate the layer twice by pressing Ctrl or Command plus D. Then you hold Ctrl or Command and click and drag the top layer to the top, snapping it to the middle layer, and drag the bottom layer to the bottom, again snapping it to the middle layer. Also, don't forget to offset each layer on the timeline by one frame. The bottom one should happen one frame early, the top one should happen one frame late. That way you just get the feeling of a film reel passing upwards through a projector. I should also add here that if your sequence has any sound, like mine does, you need to turn off the sound for the top duplicate and the bottom duplicate. Otherwise you get three, three duplicates, duplicates of the same sound playing at the same time, but with a one frame delay and that is not fun for anyone who's listening. Then we overlay the film reel shape that we made and scale it so that each hole forms a nice little window for each frame. 
If you like, you can add some blur to your shape. Don't go overboard though, because if you blur too much, things start going transparent and you'll see where the different frames border each other. And that kind of breaks the illusion. Now let's add some dynamic movement. Select all three video layers, grab and hold the pick whip on one of them, and drag it to the film reel layer. This parents the video layers to the film reel, meaning that the video layers will now follow all the transform adjustments made to the film reel. Select the film reel and open the position and rotation parameters by pressing P followed by Shift R. Holding the Shift key here just ensures that the parameter is open in addition instead of as the only one. So now you can work with both parameters at the same time. Separate the position parameters by right clicking on it and selecting separate dimensions. Now we add the wiggle expression to all three. I'd keep the rotation very subtle with something like 0.5, 0.75 or even lower. I'd also keep the X position calm with something like 0.6, But I do like quite a bit of vertical movement. So for the Y position, perhaps something like 0.4, or even higher. I also want to give the whole thing some jitter, but since we've just used the position parameters on the film reel layer itself, we've got to get that movement elsewhere. So we right click on the timeline and add a new null layer. This is an invisible layer meant to parent other layers too, which is what we'll do with our film strip. Then we open the null layers position parameters, separate the dimensions here too, and again add the wiggle effects. This time 24 times per second, but only by a tiny amount, maybe one pixel on the X axis and two pixels on the Y. The very last thing that I want to do to the look is make the film reel feel like the piece of flexible plastic that it is. So I right click on the timeline and add a new adjustment layer. On that adjustment layer, we'll put the turbulent displace effect. Set the amount to something super low like 0.3, but whack up the size to the maximum of 1000. Then we hold Alt or Option and click the evolution stopwatch. But this time we're not using the wiggle effect. Shocker, I know. Instead, we're going to use the time expression and multiply it by 1000. How much impact the time expression has on a particular parameter can be a bit nebulous, I find. So if you're using this on different effects, you've got to experiment with a multiplication number that works for you. In this instance, time times a thousand adds about 40 degrees to the evolution for every frame, adding to the jitteriness, but in a more organic, wavy sort of way. Holy moly, we are done with the visuals. Export it as you see fit, take it into another editor like Premiere or Resolve for further use, and be proud of your lovely 16mm-esque creation. Or if you really want to make your work fly, you've got to make the audio suitable too. Most 16mm film was captured without onboard audio, so oftentimes you'd use an external recorder with an external microphone. Otherwise, you would just capture too much mechanical noise of the camera itself. So step one for authenticity is to use an external microphone, like a lavalier or a shotgun on a boom pole. You would, however, need to get your final audio onto the film reel that you want to project. And historically, there's two ways to put audio onto a film reel. Either optically, which is to say physically printing the waveform of the audio onto the film strip, which is kind of wild, or magnetically, which is to say a tiny strip of magnetic tape a little bit like a cassette. Optical audio sounds extremely lo-fi, magnetic audio has slightly more definition. It's also worth noting that typically both are done in mono, not in stereo. For emulating audio like this, I'll recommend two plugins. These don't run in After Effects, but they usually do run into non-linear editors like Adobe Premiere or DaVinci Resolve. And of course any DAW like Adobe Audition, Studio One, Ableton Live, they take plugins as well. For simplicity's sake, I'll deal with the audio straight inside my video editor. Of late, I've been using DaVinci Resolve a lot, so let's give it a try in there. Now, I don't think there's any plugins that straight up emulate optical audio, but if you listen closely, it sounds a lot like dodgy old vinyl. And lo and behold, there's a free plugin by Isotope that recreates just that. Drag it onto your audio track and dial it in so it sounds nice and lo-fi. I'd set the vinyl type to 1950 or 1960, increase the wear a bit, whack up the dust slider, and increase warp a little bit too. Both film cameras and film projectors aren't 100% consistent in their rolling speed, so adding a little bit of warp to the audio will emulate that feeling nicely. If you're not emulating optical sound but magnetic tape, I love Softube's Dirty Tape plugin. This one I should note though is not free, but it's very easy to use and it sounds delightful. 
Whack drive up to where it's crunchy and warm, whack dirt up to where it's warpy and analog, and maybe use a little bit of low cut if you've introduced too much low end. All right, let's watch the whole thing and listen to our sound edits. The summer of 2023 was such a delight, it deserved its own pretentious monologue, delivered monotonously with excessive vocal fry, and set to spacey atmospheric music, it made the ideal auditory accompaniment to a vintage film sequence. So which sound do you prefer? Crispy vinyl or warm magnetic tape? Let us know in the comments, and naturally, if you've got any questions about any of the tips and tricks and effects that we've used today, put them in the comments as well. We check them all the time, so you are sure to get an answer. And of course, if you've used any of the tips and tricks I've showed you today, leave that in the comments as well. We'd love to see your work and get inspired. But for now, thank you ever so much for watching. Don't forget to push some of the positive buttons down below, and I will see you in the next one. Ciao!